I even kind of failed at writing this show, you know? I, uh, I was like, oh, I'm gonna be deep, I'm gonna be personal, I'm gonna be vulnerable. And I would do that on stage and it would just bomb. And then I would say something really dumb like, uh, yeah, I'm starting a new Jewish dating app, it's called Rachel Profiling. <laughs> People would go nuts. So I'm starting a new Jewish dating app. It's called Rachel Profiling. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Goldish. What a crazy time this is in America, huh? Yeah, they're banning books. Did you guys hear that? There's places where they're banning books in schools. Crazy, when I was a kid in school, if there was a book they did not want us to read, they would just assign it to us. <laughs> and then we would not read it. And that, that was a good system. That worked well for a long time. I don't know why we changed that. I didn't even know that To Kill a Mockingbird was making me too woke or whatever. I never made it past the first 10 pages. I, I honestly don't even know if that's the right book for that joke. I'm serious, I, I never finished it. School's crazy right now. When I was a kid, uh, it's a lot different, you know, it's better. When I was a kid, we used to sit cross-legged, they would call it Indian style. Now, you can't say Indian style anymore, of course, it's offensive. They call that crisscross applesauce now. That's not the joke part. <laughs> when I was a kid, uh, we would rub noses and they would call that Eskimo kissing. And now, of course, they call that Alaskan indigenous consensual nasal touching. And I think that's way better. That really, really rolls off the nose. <laughs> Everything's changing. They, uh, I saw recently they got rid of the ride Splash Mountain at Disney World because they said that the movie that Splash Mountain is based on is racist. Yeah, that's right, the woke mob is now coming for my kid's favorite movie, Song of the South. <laughs> Every night my kids are like, Dad, please, can we watch 1946's Song of the South? <laughs> Sorry, that movie's canceled in our house. I apologize for saying the word canceled. I don't even like saying the word canceled, you know? It's very confusing. I just did this comedy festival in the UK and uh, some of the shows, they had to be canceled. The comedian uh, couldn't make it. They got sick or they got a prior engagement. And so, but it was too late to change the website. So the website would just say the name of the comedian and then it would say canceled. <laughs> and people were like, oh man, I got to get tickets to see that. That <laughs> sounds like he's going to say the things I can't say. That's very confusing. I just did this uh, big, my first ever shows uh, in a foreign country, and I was trying to learn more about the world, you know, expand my horizons, been watching more foreign films. I like uh, when I'm watching a show and two characters are talking in Spanish, and then they'll subtitle the whole conversation, and then one of them will say, gracias, and then they don't subtitle that. <laughs> it's like, hell yeah, I know that one, yeah. <laughs> Four years of high school French finally paying off, we got this. Sometimes I'll be walking down the street, I'll hear two people talking in a language that I don't recognize, and that's Portuguese. That's what Portuguese is. <laughs> Anyone here speak Portuguese? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I was looking at a map of South America recently. What's up with Chile? <laughs> it's too skinny, right? It's gotta be some gerrymandering going on there. That's. Nobody's that skinny naturally without Ozempic. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Chile. <laughs> Trying to watch more soccer, you know, because I was in the UK. Of course, they don't call it soccer over there. They call it chips. <laughs> <laughs> I like imagining the room where they invented soccer, you know? Some guy was like, all right, so we're all in agreement. We can't use our hands. We can only use our feet. And then another guy was like, I, I have a question. Uh, what about our heads? Can we use our heads to touch the ball? And then there was just a long pause. And the other guy was like, 
Yeah, sure, whatever, I guess. I, uh, who cares? How often is that going to come up? That's, it's not important. I like watching American football. Of course, in American football, the players cannot use their heads to touch the ball because they are too busy using them to give each other brain damage. And that's very sad. It is very sad how many former NFL players have brain damage. And uh, what are you going to do? You're not going to get rid of football. I got to have something to talk to my dad about. And uh, I do like watching the Olympics. I'm a big fan of the Olympics. Yeah, thank you. And uh, say what you want about the Olympics. They really have cornered the market on measuring swimming pools, haven't they? Sorry, is my Olympics material too controversial for anybody? I didn't know I was stepping in hot water. Yeah. I was in a thrift store in Scotland and uh, they had a sign that said, no haggling, the price is the price. And I was like, this feels anti-Semitic. I, uh... <laughs> Am I not welcome here? Is that what you're saying? That's... Look, here's what happened. This is my first special, and uh, thank you, yes. I thought, I thought to myself, maybe I'll, I'll get deep. Maybe I'll get personal. Maybe I'll get vulnerable. But that's hard for me. That's not normally the type of comedy that I do. You know, I'm the kind of comedian. I went on the Craig Ferguson show, and I said, did you guys know every year 400 Jewish men die trying to remove a sweater while walking down a flight of stairs? <laughs> That's the type of comedy I do, so this is a little different, you know? <laughs> I think I'd be farther along maybe in my comedy career if I wasn't so focused on being a parent, which is why it is so pathetic that I'm such a terrible parent. I should be <laughs> better at it for how much energy I've put in. Lockdown, lockdown was tough with two kids, you know, trying to entertain them all day without resorting to screen time. So we mostly just have them listen to true crime podcasts. <laughs> I was like, no, you're not gonna watch Paw Patrol. That is gonna rot your brain. We are gonna sit here and solve this murder as a family. That's how today's gonna go. <laughs> My son figured out who killed Epstein. We were all very proud. It was, uh... <laughs> Turns out it was Epstein. I had one week where I was home with my son, my eight-year-old, and uh, I had to watch him all day while also working. So the deal I made, I said, you can watch as much Disney Plus as you want, but it has to be from the National Geographic documentary section. So he watched all the documentaries about dinosaurs and all the documentaries about sharks, and then eventually he gets to the lost city of Machu Picchu. I was like, oh, okay, he'll learn something. And within the first five minutes of the documentary, the narrator said the word virgins like 20 times. <laughs> he was like, the lost virgins of the sun were selected at age eight to serve the emperor for the remainder of their miserable lives. And my son was like, hey, I'm eight. And I was like, we're gonna watch Bluey. That's enough of that. That's... <laughs> Two kids trying to raise them both with good manners. You know, I want them to remember to say thank you. And also when somebody else forgets to say thank you, to say a passive aggressive, you're welcome. That's very important. <laughs> My son's very funny. He uh, has always been funny ever since he was little. I remember he was about three and he looked at my wife and he said, uh, can I touch your boobs? She was like, no, you cannot touch my boobs. And he said, uh, can I do it quietly? <laughs> nah, dude, that's way creepier, trust me. It's not a volume issue. One day we're walking by this mail truck and he sees the mailman standing outside his truck and he just looks at me and he goes, that mailman is going to die. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about, dude? And then he said, because he's smoking a cigarette. <laughs> oh, okay, good, all right. Glad you're an anti-tobacco zealot <laughs> and not a cold-blooded serial killer. That was the way it sounded. <laughs> when you said that. Took him to the train show. We took my kids to the train show at the holidays. And uh, it's all 
parents of young kids at the model train show with their young kids. There was one middle-aged guy there by himself. And I figure there's two possible explanations for that. Either uh, one, he is a child predator looking to steal kids and take them home with him. Or two, much creepier, he is an adult model train enthusiast. I think we can all agree that's way worse. Get away from that guy, kids. He's got railroads in the basement. Come on, let's go. My son is eight, and uh, he's almost old enough to walk to school by himself. He's like a couple years away. And sometimes I'll see kids who look like they're a couple years older than him walking to school by themselves. And I'll want to ask them, how old were you when your parents let you start walking to school by yourself? But of course you can't ask them that because then you're the reason they can no longer walk to school by themselves. <laughs> it's a real paradox. I don't like my son playing with guns. I don't like him talking about guns, you know? Even when he's playing with a water gun in the pool, I call it a squirter, and then I realize that's way worse. That's, uh... No eight-year-old needs to hear that word. That's gross. <laughs> two kids. My whole life is laundry. That's all I do all day with two kids at home. It's just laundry. Yeah, thank you. We have a couple other parents here who don't like playing with their kids, so they're like, I'll do the laundry. That sounds like <laughs> my job, yeah. Here's how much laundry I do. If somebody offered me a Make America Great Again hat, I obviously would not take it, but if somebody offered me a Make America Great Again t-shirt, I would definitely think about it, because I'd be like, well, that's one more day, I don't have to do laundry. I, uh, <laughs> do these come in kid sizes? I'll take two more. <laughs> We were at a uh, museum recently, and uh, they were giving out free yellow whistles to combat anti-Asian bigotry. And it's pretty exciting. Ever since they got these whistles, my kids have been combating anti-Asian bigotry all day and all night. We're very <laughs> proud. I'm like, guys, please, can we go to sleep? It's three in the morning. Maybe combat anti-Asian bigotry tomorrow. <laughs> I had to go to the pharmacy recently to pick up a prescription for my daughter. And the pharmacist asked me, what is your daughter's birth date? And I said, it's 10, 23, 19. And the pharmacist said, 2019? <laughs> and I said, no, my daughter is 103 years old. <laughs> but I look great, don't I? I look fantastic. I want my kids to understand that boys and girls are equal, men and women can do all the same things. Very important to model that behavior for them. You know, sometimes I forget. Like my daughter came into the room, she was wearing a pretty pink dress. I was like, oh my God, look at you. You look so good at science. You know, I caught myself and now, <laughs> her self-esteem is through the roof. She wants to see Oppenheimer instead of Barbie. We're all very proud. <laughs> Say it with me, we need more women building atomic bombs. Am I right? Thank you, yes, okay. I saw Barbie, I, I loved it, I thought it was great. A lot of men, I think, did not like the Barbie movie, you know? I think they were just jealous because typically it takes a man three and a half hours to make a great movie and Greta Gerwig did it in under two. I think that's... Uh... It's important for my kids to understand that men and women are equal, both my kids. My son started playing baseball and the coach came up to me after one of the games and he said, hey, I think you have to talk to your son because a girl came up to bat for the other team and he starts yelling, easy out. Yeah, I was horrified. So I went up to him after the game. I said, did you say easy out because there was a girl up for the other team? And he said, no. I said, easy out because I know her and she's bad at baseball. <laughs> Okay, all right. As long as you'd be equally cruel to a seven-year-old boy who stinks at sports. That's all I care about. That's... I want them to know men and women are equal. It's important for my kids to know that I'm also gambling away their college fund on women's sports. I am. I, uh... I'm a fan duel feminist. That's what I call myself. Let's go Lady Vols and the points. Am I right? Yeah. My daughter uh, recently said to me, Daddy, why do you have two noses? Yeah. 
And I know that she meant nostrils, you know, but still, again, felt anti-Semitic. I'm just saying, I... Sometimes my daughter will say that she's a boy. You know, I think she's just messing with me. It is fine if she ends up deciding that she's a boy. I'm definitely more progressive than I would have been in a pre previous generation, you know. 20 years ago, I would have been like, until you're 18, my house, my rules, you're a girl. And now I'm like, why don't we talk about it when you're five? <laughs> when you've really had a chance to think things through, make an informed decision. I try to be a progressive parent, you know? I have to be progressive, I live in New York City. I, uh, and I stayed in New York City throughout the entire pandemic, by the way, because I, yes, thank you. Yeah. Because I believe that real New Yorkers do not abandon New York City, we stay and we gentrify the shit out of it. That's, that's right, thank you. I'm not leaving the city until I can open up an ice cream parlor in a neighborhood that can't afford it, that's right. We're gonna have eight different varieties of vanilla, $8 a cup each. You can't do that in the suburbs, it's no fun. Speaking as somebody who lived in New York City throughout the entire pandemic and also uh, lived downtown on 9-11, I can honestly say that I will be bringing up both of those facts in conversation as much as I possibly can for the rest of my life. Thank you, thank you. I didn't, I didn't go to Harvard, I need something to brag about, okay? I, I did live here on 9-11, it was a horrible day. <laughs> horrible day. I did have a pretty good September 12th, if I'm being totally honest. <laughs> September 12th, 2001. I remember I had just started this new job with a bunch of young people and we all went into the office and they were just like, everybody go home, you don't need to be here. So we all went to Central Park and we all just kind of sat around talking and getting to know each other and it was beautiful weather and one by one everyone started to leave and it was just me, this guy and this girl. And we had like a lovely afternoon of just hanging out and trying to forget our troubles and talk. And later I found out that the two of them had recently started secretly dating. <laughs> and the whole time they were just like, when the fuck is this guy gonna leave? <laughs> They're married now with kids. Do you know how annoying you have to be to be the worst part of somebody's 9-11 week? That's, uh... <laughs> I literally hijacked their date, I did. That's, that's bad. I remember about a week after 9-11, I was at this, uh, dive bar and we were all crowded around the TVs. They were showing George W. Bush's first speech to Congress. And everybody was glued to the TV except for this one guy. He was playing that golf video game, Golden Tee. <laughs> and he was playing it really loud too. Like every time he missed a putt, he'd be like, come on. He had no interest in what George W. Bush had to say about 9-11. And history has proven that man correct. He, uh, <laughs> he played that day perfectly. He really did. Every time I'm in a cool neighborhood like this, I'm always so happy that, you know, see all the young people out and about. My first thought is always like, man, I'm so happy that young people still wanna to move to New York City and pursue their dreams. And then my next thought is always, I hope I never have to actually talk to any of these people. They all, they all seem awful. Of course, the only people that can afford to live in New York City in Manhattan now are Nepo babies, of course. I don't know why I pointed at you, sir, I'm sorry. I don't know anything about who your parents are. A lot of surprising Nepo babies out there. You guys ever heard of the Muppet Babies? <laughs> Turns out, I didn't know this, all their parents are Muppets. I, some of us wanted to be Muppets. We didn't have the advantages they did. We couldn't jump to the front of the line. All we had was Kermit's voice, Gonzo's nose, and a dream. We, we struggled. <laughs> New York City's a tough place to raise kids. You know, I was on the train with my two kids and this guy just starts smoking weed right next to us on the train. And I had to take my kids and move to the other end of the car because I was jealous of him. <laughs> I was like, that guy made all the right life choices and I'm stuck here with these two. I, 
very expensive raising kids in New York City. You know, we have, we have a tiny two-bedroom apartment, two kids. It's hard. That's why when they found those classified documents in Trump's bathroom, I was like, I get it. Bathroom is where my file cabinet is. I, uh, <laughs> I get bored on the toilet. I start reading my tax returns. That's uh, 2012. Let's go through it. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a tweet from Steve Harvey. He said, you know, I was 40 when I got the Steve Harvey show. Never give up on your dreams. And when I saw that tweet, I was 41 years old. That's true. I... <laughs> I was like, can I give up now, Steve? I'm exhausted. <laughs> and it's even harder for women to become successful in their 40s, which is so unfair, you know, because women also live longer. So if you're a guy and you're in your 40s and you haven't made it yet, at least you have the comfort of knowing you're probably gonna die soon. That's, <laughs> that's something. Anyone here in their 20s? Yeah, some people in your 20s, yeah. People probably tell you, like, oh, you have your whole life in front of you, right? Yeah. No. It's half over, sorry to say. Yeah. Even less if you're Jewish and you try to remove a sweater while walking down a flight of stairs. That's very dangerous. Yeah. Been confronting my mortality, you know, now that I'm in my 40s. I was in a hospital recently. I noticed they didn't have a 13th floor at the hospital when I was on the elevator. I was like, I feel like you guys of all people should have a better plan than superstition <laughs> in the hospital. It's like, well, we did everything we could to save Nana. We, uh, we skipped right from the 12th to the 14th floor. We got rid of all the black cats. We replaced all the medicine with rabbit's feet. That was all we could think of, sorry. I went to the dermatologist recently. <laughs> and this was weird. I noticed that he was wearing the wrong scrubs. Like they said the name of a different doctor on them and then instead of dermatologist, it said gastroenterologist. <laughs> I was like, what's going on? I tried to run through all the possible scenarios. Like maybe he just grabbed the wrong laundry or maybe he's high on drugs and then I figured the most logical scenario is it's a Mrs. Doubtfire situation. <laughs> you know, like he's running back and forth across the hallway and he's seeing patients across the hall as a gastroenterologist and then he's seeing me as a dermatologist and each time he's changing his outfit. <laughs> and then the eighth time he forgot and I finally caught him. I'm a 90s kid, so I just assume everybody is trying to Mrs. Doubtfire me. <laughs> Like if an old woman is throwing fruit at me, I'm like, well, it's probably my dad. I, uh, yeah. I'm in my 40s. Uh, I have to watch what I eat now, you know? I had these pretzels recently that were made out of cauliflower. And I was kind of surprised. They taste just like regular cauliflower. They, they nailed it. I have bad stomach problems. That's why I gotta be careful, you know? I was in this, uh, one time, I was in this really crowded sports bar and I had to go use the bathroom. Turned out it was just one single occupancy bathroom. And I was in there for about 10 minutes. And when I came out, there was a long line of people waiting for the bathroom. And the guy's first in line just looks at me and goes, what's up, shit guy? <laughs> he got me. I had to think quickly. I was like, I was masturbating, okay? Let's... <laughs> Get our minds out of the gutter, people, please. <laughs> I had to give up seltzer. My nutritionist made me give up seltzer. Said it was infecting my digestion. So I was at the supermarket with my wife and she said, should we buy seltzer? And I said, I can't, I'm off seltzer. And she said, you know, you've become pretty boring since you gave up seltzer. <laughs> Which is a pretty searing indictment of how exciting my life was in the first place. Apparently what was keeping the spark in my marriage was carbonated water, yeah. And now everybody drinks seltzer. You know what you don't see people drinking out and about is uh, Bailey's Irish cream. I feel like 90% of all Bailey's is just poured down the sink the day before you move. People going, I don't think this unrefrigerated cream is gonna transport very well. like kind of a miracle it survived this long at room temperature in the first place. 
Everyone's trying to be healthy, you know? I think you can sell stuff for a lot more money if you claim that it's healthy, you know? Like, I bet I could get 10 bucks a bottle for just that water that feta cheese comes floating in. <laughs> All I have to do is call it a Greek cleanse. That's my <laughs> sales pitch. Everyone's trying to be healthy. You used to see ranch dip everywhere. You know, anytime you see carrots and celery, there'd be ranch dip next to it. Then, somehow a few years ago, hummus just took ranch dip deep out into Brooklyn and shot it, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Like, no, you don't work this veggie platter anymore. This is, this is my corner. Yeah. I was in a supermarket recently. They were selling something called Young Fresh Coconut. And I was like, don't make me feel like a pervert just for wanting to buy coconut, okay? <laughs> Not interested in your barely legal coconut. <laughs> just find me a coconut as a stepmom, please. That's, that's my thing. I was talking to my sister-in-law recently about how to tell if a pineapple is ripe. Anybody here have a method to tell if a pineapple is ripe? Anyone? No? Anyone? No? Pull the leaf out. Pull the leaf out. Thank you. I heard it. If you want to tell if a pineapple is ripe, you pull the leaf out. And if it comes out, the pineapple is ripe. My sister-in-law had never heard this. She said, I can't believe I was going around sniffing the bottom like an asshole. And it took me a second to realize that in that analogy, she was the asshole. <laughs> and not the bottom of the pineapple. <laughs> I was like, why are you going around sniffing assholes to see if they're ripe? That's <laughs> gross. I gotta be careful being a man in my 40s, you know. I, uh, there's certain things you cannot do as a 43-year-old man, because they come off too creepy, you know? Like, if a friend of mine wishes his daughter a happy 18th birthday on social media, I cannot like that post. <laughs> that is a trap. And I definitely should not have commented, finally, that was a mistake, that was my fault. <laughs> I take responsibility for that one. Here's the thing, you guys, here's the thing. I'm allowed to make jokes like that because I'm not actually attracted to 18-year-old women. If I see an 18-year-old woman walking down the street, the only thing I think to myself is, oh man, I wonder if she would watch my kids so I could go to Costco by myself. Wouldn't that be, <laughs> wouldn't that be a hot Saturday night? <laughs> my son, my, my eight-year-old, he actually loves going to Costco with me. He likes the free samples that they give out there, which is ironic considering he's never paid for food once in his goddamn life. <laughs> As far as he's concerned, the whole world is free samples, I guess. Yeah. I'm very happily married. I think uh, the secret to a happy marriage is we have a deal, which is that if at any point in the marriage one of us becomes unhappy, we must stay in it forever and make the other one miserable. That's, <laughs> that's only fair. I love my wife. I'm not one of these wife guys. You know, these wife guys are always talking about how much they love their wives, posting about it. Usually on an anniversary, there's a Facebook post with a bunch of numbers in it. Like 10 years, four houses, three cities, two kids. <laughs> Happy anniversary, sweetie. I do think that would be an amazing way to announce your divorce. <laughs> 10 years, four cities, two kids, 400 public fights, 40 emotional affairs. One actual affair. <laughs> Everybody pick one of us and unfriend the other. <laughs> Split you right down the middle. <laughs> My wife is a lot more popular than I am on social media, which is really annoying because I'm a comedian and she's just a regular person. <laughs> <laughs> I posted uh, on Facebook, I posted a link to a clip of my stand-up and it got like 14 likes. I was like, all right, I thought that was a good clip, whatever. My wife posts on Facebook, she's trying to wish her friend's son a happy birthday, but instead of posting it on her friend's wall, she accidentally posted it on her own wall. So it's just a free-floating status update that said, happy birthday, little man. <laughs> In reference to nothing. <laughs> and it got 38 likes. I was like, this is bullshit, this is. 
The only thing that bothers me more than guys who always talk about how much they love their wives is guys who complain about their wives to me. Like, they find out that I'm married and they think that gives them license to be like, oh, I totally would do that, you know, except for my wife, you know. I don't know. Maybe I'm old-fashioned. I just think that kind of hatred and resentment should be reserved for your children. I really... <laughs> I saw a statistic recently that 55% of marriages end in divorce, and another 25% of married people are only staying together for the kids or for their finances. That leaves like 20% of us that are happily married. That's basically a fetish. It's like me and people who sniff feet. I, mean, I didn't know being happily married was so kinky. My wife and I were thinking of uh, names for our daughter, and uh, one of the names we considered was Serena. And then we decided we can't name her Serena. Almost simultaneously, we were just like, well, we can't name her Serena because everyone will think of, and I said Serena Williams, and my wife said Gossip Girl. <laughs> well, I won that argument. We named her Venus, and... Uh, <laughs> My wife joined me in the UK. She flew the day after me because she had to stay late for work. And a couple people asked me, they go, oh, did you fly separate in case something happened to the plane? <laughs> Apparently this is a thing people do when they go somewhere without their kids, they take separate flights so they don't leave their kids orphans. I don't know if my kids would be cool with that. If I came back and was like, well, I have some good news, I... <laughs> I planned ahead. <laughs> My brother is 40, he's uh, single, and we were hanging out, we were about to go out to a bar, and he asked me, can I wear this? Does this outfit look okay? And I said, well, that depends. Are you trying to like hook up and meet girls? He said, no. So I said, well, then yeah. fine. I'm a grown man. I have a wife. I have children. I have life insurance. You got to have life insurance. I do find it is hard to call up and ask a question about your life insurance policy without making it sound like you're planning on murdering your spouse. <laughs> trying to listen to podcasts and get some advice from famous comedians on how they became successful. And they all say the same thing in their interviews. They all say, uh, yeah, you know, you, you gotta write jokes every day. You gotta perform every night. And I always think to myself, man, I gotta listen to more of these podcasts. I think that's <laughs> the secret. I've been doing comedy like 20 plus years and I don't really have that many fans. Is that weird? I, <laughs> I do have, I've been successfully employed as a writer for a long time. So I do have like young white guys in their 20s who come to my shows and ask me for advice on how they can steal my job. <laughs> and I always say the same thing. I say, you gotta write jokes every day. You gotta get on stage every night. It's all in my podcasts. Yeah. I did have one weird fin fan interaction after a show once. Uh, I was doing a jo show where you were supposed to do new jokes. And this, I thought I had a great set. This girl comes up to me after the show. She goes, uh, hey, uh, thank you for doing the show. Um, I was a little disappointed because this is a show where people are supposed to do new jokes and I had heard you do some of those jokes before. Yeah. What a weird thing to say to somebody, right? I felt very attacked. Then a couple days later, I get an email and it's from this guy. He says, that was my friend who said that to you after the show and I was with her and I just wanted to say, I thought that was very rude and I wanted to apologize. I said, thank you, somebody finally with some good sense. And then the email continues, and he says, besides, you don't go to where she works and knock the dick out of her mouth. <laughs> and I was like, now I think I'm back on that girl's side. I think she's the cool one in the friendship. <laughs> then, I swear to God, a week later, I'm at, of all places, High holiday services. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the day we're supposed to apologize for our sins. And who do I run into but that girl? 
And she said, oh my God, I can't believe I saw you. I'm so mad, I, I feel so bad about what I said, and I've been wanting to apologize, and here I run into you on the Day of Atonement. And right then and there, I converted to Christianity just to get out of the conversation. <laughs> I grew up less religious Jewish and more cultural Jewish, you know? We didn't go to synagogue every Saturday, but every Sunday we did buy a dozen bagels. <laughs> and we would eat half of them and put the other half in the freezer. And then the next Sunday, we would do the same thing again. <laughs> buy a dozen bagels, eat half, put the other half in the freezer. You do that every day for about a year until you have a freezer full of frozen bagels that nobody's ever gonna eat and then you throw them all out, and then the process begins anew. <laughs> they say we control everything. That's what the anti-Semites say, the Jews control everything. Not true. We control some things. Hollywood, sure, whatever. When Kanye lost his deal with Adidas, I was like, we definitely don't control athletic sneakers. That one, uh, <laughs> that one was on you. And then Kyrie Irving, the basketball player, he got in trouble for posting a link to an anti-Semitic documentary. And I'm sorry, but that's what happens when you let a non-Jewish person make a movie. That's, uh... <laughs> that's dangerous territory. Yeah. It's crazy to think of all the things I could have done with my life if I hadn't been trying to be a famous comedian, you know? I could have become a good person. Wouldn't that have been something? <laughs> but I'm not. I'm too self-involved to be a good person, you know? I'm so self-involved, my pronouns are I, I'm. That's, uh, that's how much the world revolves around me. And I'm really dumb. I never remember anything. Like, I, I can never remember. Does bisexual mean you have sex twice a week or once every two weeks? I can never <laughs> keep that one straight. Sometimes being dumb helps me out. Like when crypto came out, you know? I was too dumb to understand it, too lazy to figure it out. And then the crypto market crashed, and I was like, well, I've always been good at sniffing out bullshit. <laughs> Played that one perfectly. A lot of people out there are even dumber than I am. That's what's scary, you know? People that think that climate change is not real. If climate change is not real, explain what happened to all of the rainforest cafes. You can't. Where, <laughs> where did they go? We're in a big city. We should be surrounded by them. I'm sorry. I think we know what happened to all the actual rainforests. It's very sad. They were chopped down and turned into CVS receipts. <laughs> when do you think the whole world started to go downhill? If I had to pinpoint... <laughs> if I had to pinpoint the moment where everything started to head downhill, I really do think it's when they invented vaping. When some scientist was like, how do we combine the cancer you get from cigarettes with the cancer you get from cell phones? And everybody was just like, sure, I'll try it. No questions asked. <laughs> Nobody's trying to solve all the problems we have in the world, you know, the politicians in Washington. The only thing over the last several years that 100 senators have agreed on is that we should make daylight savings time permanent. <laughs> That's the big problem they decided to address. <laughs> setting the clocks back and forth. That's not even how I would handle it. If I was in charge, I say, set the clocks forward one hour every six months and just get this shit over with faster. That's, that's what I would do. Yeah. Gotta be careful, there's a lot of dangerous conspiracy theories out there, you know? White replacement theory. This idea that they're bringing in immigrants from outside the country to replace white people. False, dangerous, conspiracy. I do think if it is true, I'm one of the white people who should be replaced. I. <laughs> I feel like there's got to be an immigrant who could tell these jokes with more pizzazz than I can, right? We all, we all agree on that. I try to be more progressive. I was in the car with my friend. He was driving. I was in the passenger seat. The light turned green, and he didn't go. And I said, why didn't you go when the light turned green? And he said, I'm colorblind. And I said, that's not good enough. You have to be anti-racist. And... <laughs> I think he got it on the way home. <laughs> Just like some of you will. <laughs> and men, we have to be aware of all the horrible things that happen to women. I've been trying to learn more, educate myself. 
I was pretty shocked when I learned that there are men who will force women to watch them masturbate. Because I would say most of my life has been spent waiting for everybody else to leave the room. <laughs> so that I may begin masturbating. My kink is privacy, is what I'm trying to say. That's... <laughs> it's hard not to compare yourself to other people, you know? I, uh, especially me, I started comedy with all these people who are insanely successful now. You know, I started comedy with John Mulaney and Ali Wong and Amy Schumer, and I'm not name-dropping, okay? I, uh, I'm admitting that we all started at the exact same time, <laughs> and they've skyrocketed past me. I'm doing the opposite of name dropping. I'm picking names up off the ground is what I'm doing. <laughs> and I don't know honestly what those people have that I don't other than talent and work ethic. I, <laughs> yeah. But I guess I'm lucky, you know? I, I'm lucky I've been employed as a writer for so long. I, uh, a lot of comedians, stand-up comedians, they were out of work during the pandemic because comedy clubs were closed. I went a whole year without doing stand-up comedy, and then my very first show back, my mouth accidentally touched the microphone, and then I took another six months off. I was like, I don't need this. <laughs> I love being a writer, but I am happy being back on stage where people have always told me, Matt, you're a great writer, and... <laughs> that's why I consider this home, you know? Even my writing goals have changed. You know, when I was in my 20s, I was like, oh, I want to write something that will blow people's minds and completely change their worldview, make them think about everything differently. And now I'm in my 40s, and I don't even want to watch something like that. <laughs> it sounds exhausting. <laughs> like, who wrote Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives? I just want to <laughs> give some people something they can fall asleep to. <laughs> Maybe I'll write the next This Is Us. Wouldn't that be something? No. I've never seen the show. <laughs> From the title, I just assume it's a show about people arriving at their subway stop. <laughs> it's like, well, This Is Us, we're here. I don't know what we're gonna do with the next 58 minutes. I saw something crazy on TV the other day. I saw this commercial that didn't have Kevin Hart in it. I was like, is that? Is that a mistake? It was like an error commercial. You know, I was just on strike. Yeah, on strike from writing for five months. Yeah, thank you. It's hard. It's hard. Hard not to write jokes for that long. I love writing jokes. I love writing jokes so much I would do it for free. I really would. The union asked me not to take that bargaining position. They, they did not invite me to the negotiating table for some reason. I'm lucky to have been employed at the same place for such a long time, but uh, you know, I wasn't always that lucky. The first three writing jobs I had, I got fired from all of them. You know? But they say you have to have failure before you have success. Like Abraham Lincoln, he lost five elections before he ever became president. You know, and maybe someday with a little luck, I'll be assassinated. Wouldn't that be something? That would, what a thrill to be famous enough to be assassinated. Tried writing a screenplay. What do you think is the right age to tell a screenplay it's adapted? <laughs> See, dumb jokes, that's all I got. I thought maybe I would get artificial intelligence to write some jokes for me, for my act. So I asked ChatGPT to write some stand-up in the style of Matt Goldich. And within a day, it just started posting crowd work videos of itself. <laughs> That's where it's at right now, comedians, you know, the crowd work. That's what you see anytime you go on Instagram. It's all comedians doing crowd work. And uh, I don't know, I feel left out. I'm not... I'm not good at crowd work, you know? I don't know. <laughs> Where are you from? Japan. Japan, okay. You're from Japan? I was born in Japan. You were born in Japan, on an Air Force base in Japan. Okay, well. Yeah, I got nothing for that. <laughs>
Let's do one more. Sir, where are you from? Right there. Uh, California. California. Okay, well, I don't come to California and knock the Golden Gate Bridge out of your mouth. Is that... <laughs> Is that how you do crowd work? <laughs> I don't know. The chat GPT thing is crazy. It's crazy that there's all this new technology, you know, that exists, but we're still relying on some of the old technology. I was in the car recently, and I was listening to the terrestrial radio. It's like a transmission from another era. The DJ is like, hey, do you like the Beatles? I was like, yeah, I like the Beatles. He goes, well, make sure you tune in Wednesday at noon. We're going to play three Beatles songs in a row. I was like, wow, you can't get that anywhere. <laughs> Wednesday, my birthday? It's exciting. I like that Dolly Parton song, Jolene. It's probably one of my favorite songs of all time. You know the song, Jolene, this woman, yeah. She's stolen Dolly Parton's man which kind of makes you wonder, imagine how big Jolene's breasts must be to have pulled that off. That might be the greatest joke I've ever written. And maybe it's a little sexist because it's about a woman's breast, but it's also about an old woman's breast. So really it's anti-ageist and that's the important thing. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you for coming, appreciate it. Thank you.